Kurt, you're taking me some really interesting places. <laughs> this is awesome. In the middle of a cave. Well, it's actually an air shaft for one of the uh, coal mines, for okay. one we were looking at a little bit earlier. Uh, but the, the, the top of that air shaft is collapsed, so we can see some of the rocks above it. Yeah. And we're seeing some things we've already seen before. Right up here, you see some fossil logs. But they're not in sandstone like we saw it before. Mm -hmm. They're actually in shale. And if we look a little further above it, we've actually got a coal seam oh, right up there yeah. that runs right over our heads uh -huh. and on from there. And notice an interesting thing about this coal seam is the very flat top. Yes. So the coal has fallen out and yes, it's left right. a very, very flat surface. Uh -huh. That's one of the characteristics of coal. It's got a flat top. Almost every coal seam has a, an incredibly flat top and a flat bottom. I can see this in the, uh -huh. on the other side of the exposure. Uh, so two of the features of coal can be seen here. And another thing that can't really be seen unless you look at it under a microscope, like Steve Austin studied coal for his uh, PhD dissertation. Mm -hmm. uh, and looking at it in a microscope, he could identify plant parts in the coal, specifically bark in the coal. So okay. the question is, why what's, is what's coal made yeah. of bark? Mm -hmm. And the idea is we've got these logs. Uh, ultimately, what Steve did was propose that there was a log mat floating on a body of water. Mm -hmm. Logs are floating on the surface. And they're lycopod logs. They're logs that are of trees that are hollow. They've got bark, but they okay. do not have any internal secondary right. wood. While they're floating on the water, they roll against one another, peeling the bark mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. The bark gets waterlogged and falls down to the bottom. So as the water, as the uh, log mat floats about, it drops this layer of bark. Depositing the bark all around where it's floating. So it could float out of that area and deposit bark someplace uh -huh. else. But what that allows is if you already have a flat surface, the bark falls on a flat surface producing a flat bottom to that pile of uh -huh. bark. And then when the, the log mat floats out of that region, it leaves a flat top on the pile of bark. Mm -hmm. Then later the bark can be coalified into coal. And that would explain the coal seams. The fact that they're made of layers of bark, of mm -hmm. pieces of bark. The fact that they're flat topped and flat bottomed. Yeah. And those are difficult, actually basically impossible to explain any other way. Well, yeah, because see, I was taught under the conventional paradigm that coal takes a long time to form and it forms in the bottom of a swamp. But that's not what we're seeing here. No, that's not what we're seeing. If it was a swamp, several things would be uh, true of what we're looking at. First of all, if it's a swamp, you've got trees growing mm -hmm. rooted in soil. Mm -hmm. So you would expect to see roots in the material underneath the coal. And what do you see? You see logs. I don't see any, I don't see any uh, roots in here. And underneath modern swamps, you've got lots of roots all over the You're place. Right. So we don't see that. Plus. Think of the bottom of the swamp. Do you think the bottom of the swamp is nice and oh, flat? Yeah. No, it's not. It's, it's as uneven as the surface mm -hmm. would be with mm -hmm. all these trees sticking up in it. We don't have trees growing from, through the coal down into the, into the material underneath. We got this flat surface. All of a sudden, we've got coal. Yeah. And in a swamp, if you dig up the stuff in the swamp to see what kinds of plant material, there's mm -hmm. lots of plant material in there. But if you pick it up, it's, well, Steve would describe it as coffee grounds. It's a good okay. description. More fine than Yeah, the, the roots growing through this stuff messes it up, mm -hmm. bioturbates it is what we call it, and, and destroys the structure. You can't find pieces of bark in there. They're not recognizable. They're tiny little fragments. You can't find branches. They've been broken up and they're unrecognizable. Leaves are unrecognizable. So if that's what coal was formed from, you wouldn't find pieces of bark in it. But that's what Steve was finding in his coal seam, chunks of bark. Yeah. So he's got a flat bottom, chunks of bark, and then a flat top. It, you got a forest growing there. How do you shave the forest off flat right. so that the coal stops all of a sudden yeah. and it allows you to get a very, very flat surface? How does that happen? make any sense? Yep. So the conventional explanation with a swamp over long periods of time just didn't work. As a matter of fact, what Steve did is he was interested in doing a, a dissertation on coal, went to a, a, an institution famous for studying coal, uh, Penn State, and then asked, okay, 
of all the coal seams that you're familiar with in the United States, what's the best example of a marsh produced coal? Mm -hmm. And they directed him to the Kentucky 12 coal, and that's what he did his dissertation on. But when he looked at it, he found a flat base, a flat top, and besides that, even seats in it, thin layers of shale in the middle of the coal with flat bottoms and tops to even those thin layers and pieces of bark in the coal. And he concluded, I can't explain this in, the, in that in model. Standard way. So what he did was develop for his dissertation a new model. If this log mat blew away, you could have a layer of, of bark and then a layer of mud could come in, an inch of mud could come in place and cover mm -hmm. the, the bark that's already there. Then the log mat can float in, deposit more coal, mm -hmm. float back out again, get another, another thin layer. layer of mud. And he could repeat this any number of times. Uh -huh. Perhaps as much as the 120 times you got coal seams in the Illinois Basin, for example, wow. as you float yeah. this back and forth. And he, he defended this interpretation of the Kentucky 12 coal seam for his PhD dissertation, and it was accepted. And of course the comment was something like, well, we just, I guess, we just happened to find the one coal that, that uh -huh. has those characteristics. A wild theory. But all the coals I've ever yeah. seen have those same characteristics. Mm -hmm. Flat mm -hmm. bottoms, flat tops, and it just can't be explained by these yeah. marsh theories. Yeah. So, well, Kurt, help me here, because if, if we have a layer of peat uh, from the from bark, that is a deposit on the bottom. And then we have a mud layer that comes over the top. It would appear to me that the mud layer, shouldn't it just destroy that peat layer? How does it get over the top? Well, uh, subsequent to that kind of research, Steve's done some other research on trying to explain how mud layers are formed and sand layers are formed. And uh, well, I think he's already talked to you about the mud nautiloid, uh, yes. nautiloid bed. Well, the right. nautiloids are in, a, a lime mud, and the idea there is that that's a mud flow that flowed uh, over the surface of the bottom of a body of water, mm -hmm. and it, it hydroplanes. Okay. It's going so fast that there's a layer of water between yes. it and the substance underneath and just Correct. shoots right across. Well, it doesn't deform when it's hydroplane, like if you hydroplane on your vehicle on, on, the, on the car. Mm -hmm. It doesn't leave any it. skid marks, sure. okay? Right. It doesn't mess up the, uh -huh. the, the, the surface because you're not on the surface, you're on water. Yeah. So if there was a thin layer of water on top of your, your bark layer, you could have a mud flow come in an inch thick, three inches yes. thick, uh, a foot thick, and not disturb the bark that's already yeah. there. Nicely well, deposit on top and... Well, if that's the case then, uh, one would expect from a Genesis model that that thin layer of mud in between would contain fossils, but do we Actually, find sometimes it does. And when it does, it almost invariably are marine fossils. Uh -huh. Now that's really weird. Where yeah. are the marine fossils sure. come? So you yeah. got this forest, this swamp that was mm -hmm. destroyed on the land, and then got this mud that comes in with fossils from the ocean. Yep. Uh, and, and then somehow after this, deposit was made, a new forest grew without disturbing that yes. one inch yeah. thick layer. Yeah. How do you grow trees mm -hmm. in the mud layer now? Right. This makes no sense. However, if you've got the concept of this floating log mat, mm -hmm. then the log mat can drop a pile of uh, yes. bark in, can float off, be blown off to another area. You can have marine mud or non-marine mud, whatever. I mean, you could come in and deposit. Then the log mat floats back over the area, deposits more bark, mm -hmm. and then floats away. And you could repeat this any number of times in any, any yeah. sequence you want. And again, you explain all the features found in coal seams. Flat yeah. bottoms, flat uh -huh. tops, seats with flat bottoms, flat tops, even marine fossils in there. It, yeah. It's all easy, except for one thing. What's interesting about these coal seams is you can trace them from here all the way up into Canada and all the way down into the Gulf of Mexico, underneath the Gulf of Mexico, and trace them west all the way across the length of Tennessee past the Mississippi River into Missouri and trace them east 
skip the Atlantic Ocean there in Europe, all the way across Europe into Russia. Oh my goodness. The size of oh. this mat oh. of, of logs is the size of a continent. <laughs> How do we get that much? See, and, and think of that, that flood concept mm -hmm. that the Bible talks about. And if it's a global flood, you've got North America and Europe covered. And at the yeah. point these rocks are deposited, North America is smashed into Europe and they're connected. So this, this uh, log mat yeah. could float back and forth across all the way from what's now Moscow, mm -hmm. all the way over to the Mississippi River and back again, depositing coal seams over both of these continents. That are consistent across both continents, yet now separated by Ex the Atlantic. And exactly the uh -huh. same, yeah. And in the Atlantic, you don't find any coal, you don't find any of the fossils. Uh -huh. When you find the fossils, these lycopods are the exact same lycopods that are over there in Europe, exactly the same. Uh -huh. They're exactly the same. In, in fact, <laughs> the entire coal seam layer the entire Carboniferous, as they call it in, in, in Europe, is, uh, has got the same species, the same pollen, all the way through uh, what's conventionally understood to be 100 million years of time. Mm -hmm. Same plants, same animals. In fact, for my dissertation, I worked on uh, Lingula, which is a brachiopod species, a bivalve species. And the same species of Lingula metalloides and Lingula squamiferous are found from the base of the Carboniferous to the top of the Carboniferous, exactly the same species. Another person I know did a dissertation on pollen, finds exactly the same species all the way through. It's the same, it's the same forest all that's over. been deposited over all of that region. Yes. It makes sense in a flood yeah. model. It makes no sense whatsoever in the conventional. Okay, Kurt, there's, there's a question I'm sure that's in a lot of people's minds, uh, just as it would be in mine. The conventional paradigm, uh, when it talks about coal, says that coal forms over a long period of time. It, it's not a quickly formed substance. What have we found? Yeah, well, that's what I was taught. That's what I understood. I got the impression that it has to be made over a long period right. of time. I had the opportunity when I was at the University of Chicago as an undergraduate to work in the high energy, high temperature, high pressure physics lab, uh, geophysics lab, sorry. And we made rocks. <laughs> it was a really cool job. It, usually we were making metamorphic rocks, which would be, we've got a metamorphic mineral of some sort, that's a mineral that's been changed from some previous rock. Mm -hmm. We have a theory about what rocks were changed to produce this. So the idea was to grind up the rocks we thought they were made from, mix them together, put them in a little capsule, little gold capsule, uh, put them in a, in a thermos, in a heater, which goes up to a temperature we think would form that mm -hmm. mineral, mm -hmm. and then put pressure on it that we think was necessary, and, and wait whatever period of time it takes for the chemical reactions to occur, take it out, x-ray it, see if we got the mineral we mm -hmm. hypothesized. So uh, I, I shouldn't say I was doing I was just the undergraduate just doing the stuff. And, and it was really cool. We made all sorts of rocks. And it was interesting to me that those rocks didn't take long to form. In fact, huh. most of the time, the rocks we were dealing with at high temperatures uh, only took minutes. I, I could run this in an hour for almost all rocks. Huh. Now, there were, when, when you're dealing with rocks that are made at lower temperatures, cooler temperatures, it took longer. And the f slowest forming rock that I ever formed was in fact coal. And we made coal. Uh, oh. and, and it took forever. It took three or four weeks oh my goodness. to form coal. <laughs> that's <laughs> it was, and, and, and that's it, instantaneous. I, I mean, you know, it's crazy. I thought, you know, it takes a long time. Yeah. But that's the longest, that's when you're basically about the boiling point of, of water, so it's really low temperature compared mm -hmm. to the temperature of most rocks. And it took a long time. What's interesting too, here, this is cool, I just got, can't resist this. Uh, the, if, if you just put plant material into the, in, into the oven, it never formed coal. You just sit it there and nothing would happen. Uh -huh. But if you added a catalyst, the thing happened quickly. It would happen in the three weeks. And, yeah. and so the, the catalyst, of course, a catalyst in general is some substance that you add to a chemical reaction. It doesn't change doesn't change the catalyst, but the catalyst speeds the reaction mm -hmm. up. So these, this catalyst would make it possible to form coal very rapidly. And the catalyst, there's all, we experiment with all sorts of things. 
And it turns out that a whole bunch of clay minerals, Mount Marillonite, Elamite, and so on, if you put it into the, in, into the plant material, it acted as a catalyst and the thing goes to coal very quickly. Oh my goodness. Now think about this. If you burn coal, you get an ash that results yes. that is unburnable. It is the catalyst. So coal uh, is full of the catalyst. And guess where the Mount Marillonite and all that stuff comes from? It's volcanic right. ash. It actually falls down from the sky uh. from volcanic eruptions. So all you need are volcanic eruptions, which are occurring all the time during right. this, this whole thing, uh -huh. raining down this volcanic ash, and you've got what you need to form coal uh -huh. in the matter of three or four weeks. So in the, in the history that we have recorded for us in Genesis, and all that we have seen, uh, we have uh, this mat of logs producing this peat, building up on the bottom, and then we have these laminar mud flows that come in over the top, and more peat and more peat. And what you're saying then is that all of that can produce coal seams within a matter of weeks. Yes. That's in the course the of a, of a year-long flood, like we described in, the, in, in Genesis, we could produce the 150-plus coal seams that we see in the... So the by the right time now. Noah gets off the boat, we have all of those yeah, coal seams in place. It's already there. It's ready for people to burn uh -huh. and develop culture following the flood. If we go to another site down the, down the trail, okay. I can show you right. some other evidence from that forest that was destroyed yeah. in the pre-flood world to produce the, this floating mat yes. of, right. of logs. Okay. So let's I'm go right take a look you. at that. I'm right behind you.